Hey, Michelle, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. You know, I was thinking the other day, there's something incredibly ironic in the houseplant world going on right now. Um, everybody is so um, infatuated with variegation. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm to a degree infatuated with it. I love I love a good variegated plant. Mm -hmm. uh, but the interesting irony, the more variegated a plant is, chances are the weaker it's going to be because it has less chlorophyll. And so True. we're all going crazy and spending lots and lots of money on the weakest plants that we can find. <laughs> I knew you were going to bring it back that way. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for it. It's, yeah, it's but such the weak, an interesting hobby. But they're so hobby. pretty. They're so I pretty. Know, I know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, now that you've said it that way, huh, eh, gives me a different perspective. Thanks, Justin. Those are the kinds of things we think about on Plant Prescription here, the podcast about houseplants from Costa Farms. Um, if you've listened before, you know that I'm Justin. Um, and if you've not listened before, um, I'm Justin still. And yeah. I am joined by Michelle, one of our IPM <laughs> managers. Um, Michelle, tell us what an IPM manager does. Um, IPM is Integrated Pest Management. Uh, as the word implies, we work a lot with the pests. Those include insects, mites, and or disease, which is very like ominous sounding, but it's a fun job. <laughs> uh, it's a super important job too. Very much so. For anyone who owns a lot of houseplants, you know that it's pretty much inevitable that you're going to get something on them. Um, and then, you know, figuring out the best way to treat that is always a special challenge in itself. So it is a very important job with a lot of plants. Costa has a lot of plants. Uh, a lot of things come up. So Michelle is one of our MVPs here and so happy to have her joining us. I'm always happy to be here. Thank you. All right, should we dig into some questions? Yes, sir, let's do it. All right, number one is from Karen. Uh, she lives in Taylor, Mississippi. Uh, what's the best method for propagating my pothos? Should I do it in soil or water? And do I need to use rooting hormone for it? That's a good question. I think that you and I probably do things a little bit differently. Um, it, with all things, I would say it depends on how much time you have. <laughs> <laughs> on this one, it's not, it depends on this. It depends on that. It's just how much time do you have? Uh, I, I do it both ways. I do soil. I do water. I've done moss. I've done leca or leca, however you want to say it. I've done perlite. I've done it like you, pothos is a fun one because you can propagate it any which way. However, in all of those scenarios, I would say you don't need rooting hormone. It's a very, a uh, happily rooting plant. It is eager to root for you. It's rooting for you. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Justin, what are your thoughts? Uh, personally, I am not a fan of water propagation. Mm. Um, I have, over over history, had less positive experience with water than, than other types. Mm. Um, and I know that there's also the potential for the plant to have a little bit more trouble uh, transitioning from water to soil. Um, and so I will typically go straight into like a moist potting mix, or I'm also big fans of sand and no, I'm also a fan of sand. Um, I'm not multiple fans, although sometimes <laughs> it feels like I have multiple personalities. Um, <laughs> oh man, it's, we're at the end of the week here, folks. So yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, um, of, of sand and perlite. Um, I've had some really, really good luck with straight perlite. Really? Okay. Because mm -hmm, it's easy to keep moist. Yeah. Sand and perlite together or like what? No, separately. What's, what's the situation there? Just like pure sand? Yep. Either pure sand or pure perlite. I, I don't know why I've never thought never, to mix them. Yeah. I've never heard of just sand. That is very interesting. Never have I ever seen or heard of that. That is a new one. A just special. Really, you gotta really want to grow it in sand though, because those sandbags, man, fifty pounds or whatever they are, woof, woof. Interesting. I like water, and we disagree on that. I knew you were gonna disagree on this one a little bit, but I like water because it's just easy. Justin's right. You will likely have some sort of uh, what do you want to call it? Um, period of adjust adjustment period when you go from like water to soil because the roots are used to growing in one hundred percent 
water, moisture, humidity, and they, they kind of grow a little differently in water. Um, and then when you change the soil, they're like, Hey, even though the soil is wet, where's all the water? So there's going to be a little bit of a lag there, but it's really easy to do it in water. I disagree. I think it's easy to do it in water. It is. We both agree that just sticking it, cutting it and making sure you've got a node, which is, it's like a little bump on the stem, making sure that's in buried in the soil is probably the easiest thing to do. Yeah, and I think, you know, the the conditions in which you try to propagate it are more important than the medium in which you try to propagate it. You know, making sure, especially if it's something like pothos. Well, I guess not so much with pothos because to your point, it's so easy. But with most tropical house plants, it has a warm, humid environment in which to root. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in a cold climate, I know, Karen, you said you're in Mississippi. It's probably not as much of an issue, but like for me here in Oregon, using a heating mat underneath it um, can definitely help speed up propagation for some of these tropicals, especially harder to root ones than than pothos. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes uh, sense. Keep it out of, keep it out of direct sun, uh, especially if you use like a humidity dome or or something to try to capture humidity. Uh, because I had baked cuttings inadvertently uh, before. Oh, no. Yes. So easy to do. Yeah. I uh, pretty much pretty much exclusively grow indoors. So sun is never <laughs> an issue in here because it just barely ever exists. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the second part of your question, Karen, with pothos, um, I... I honestly don't see a need to use rooting hormone because it is so easy. Um, it is something that you can use with with plants that are a little um, that are a little more finicky to propagate. I've had a really bad experience with rooting hormone, so I just don't do it at all anymore. Oh, what was your bad experience, Michelle? I don't know. I don't know what happened. It just every time I used rooting hormone, the plant died i don't know i did the rate i followed the directions and i just have not had a good experience with it so i just forego rooting hormone on everything um i just you know, have ptsd you know that's a that's a good point too i think about propagation that it's important to keep in mind is that you rarely have a uh, hundred percent success rate all the time you know, propagation sure. is is always the opportunity for something to go wrong. Even if you do everything right, some cuttings just don't take. You know, yep. and we certainly see that even here at Costa Farms commercially. You know, yep. there's a there's a percentage, and our growers know the average percentage for each type of crop. You mm -hmm. know that, you know, if we take a hundred cuttings, only ninety five or eighty or whatever the variety, you know, are actually going to root and make it. Yeah, yeah, and there's a standard. You know, if you lose half. That's not good. Something, something's, something's wrong there. Half is too much, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but I would, I would just say with pothos, eh, don't make it any harder than it has to be in adding rooting hormone. Also, it's an extra cost. You don't need it. Um, all right. Moving on to question two. This is from Madeline in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Um, Madeline asks, uh, you've inspired me to try good mites, uh, to help get rid of my spider mites. What's the best way to get started with them? Yay. Yay. Good mites. Uh, I think that this is going to be something we're going to see a lot more because I've seen a lot of people, myself included, are starting to acquire a lot of plants. It's no longer the usual or the norm. I mean, look, I count like five plants, six plants. It's hard to see. And you're in the background of your photo alone. I've got like five here too. I think as people start to acquire more plants that the predatory mites may end up being a little bit more popular for indoor growers. Keep that in mind when you're looking at the cost, though, um, because it isn't for everybody. Generally speaking, they're probably going to be a little bit more expensive than, say, like a neem oil or another sort of application. However, for the lazy gardener, the lazy ho ho houseplant owner, myself included, uh, they really are a godsend because they just make life so much easier. So 
if you're positive, you have two spotted spider mites. Um, and that is what you're going after. It's very important to make sure that that's what it is. Um, if you're not positive, it's two spotted spider mites. I would recommend leaning towards something like a Californicus. Um, and you know, when you're, you're trying to figure out how many mites to buy, um, they come at Californicus comes in a couple of different forms. It comes in sachets or sachets. Um, and it also comes in like a loose fill. And it really just depends on your scenario. What you were, what were you going to ask? I could see you. No. Nope. Okay. Okay. So sachets and loose fill. Um, it really depends on your scenario. Um, if you've got a lot of plants kind of like grouped together and you honestly don't care about a little of a bit of a mess, or if you want to take a little bit more time putting them out, loose fill may be for you. If you want to just be like really quick about it, don't want to have to clean up a mess, and you want some sort of consistent release maybe a sachet um sachets are basically like little popsicle sticks with a uh, like a paper pouch on the top and in that paper pouch there are breeding mites um it's a kind of a growing system for these predatory mites so they have a food mite a breeding mite in there called uh it's a brand mite we'll just call it and that mite feeds on the fungus in the sachet and then the <laughs> predatory mite will eat that brand mite, right? So you've got a whole system inside of this little kind of popsicle stick thing. And it's really important if you get a sachet, don't rip it open, don't make a hole, don't do anything like that. Um, trust me, there is a hole on the sachet for the mites to get out. It's a very, very small hole on purpose um, because since these feeder mites are feeding on bran, it's really important to keep the humidity in there at a certain level. Um, you don't want to open it or tear it in any way because you're going to disrupt that entire system in there. So don't rip them. Don't, don't do anything with them. Um, leave them as is. I promise if you look most of the time there on the back where the actual stick is, if you look really, really, really closely, you will see a tiny hole on there and that's the hole that they come out of. Do you have anything to say about that, Justin? Nope. Okay. All, all I can't you, tell. Michelle. Okay, I can't tell because you, you're. I'm like, what do Sorry. you, what do you? Okay. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm adjusting in my chair. <laughs> okay, so sachets are a great option. Um, they can be a little bit more expensive than loose fill. However, I've seen um, the ability to like buy individual sachets versus if you're buying loose fill, you're pretty much like stuck on thousands of mites. There's very few. Um, like different amounts that you can buy. But with sachets, I've seen some people now starting to buy like one or two sachets or et cetera, et cetera. Um, they are a great place to start. The mites should, in theory, <laughs> it depends on the shipping and a lot of other things and the ambient climate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if it's indoors, in theory, it should be releasing uh, Californicus, they should be coming out of that little sachet for three to four weeks um, indoors, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, it really depends on how old they are when you get them because you don't know. Um, so that would be a great thing to do if you do get sachets. Um, don't get, don't go crazy. Don't get like one per pot. Um, that's a lot. Uh, you're probably going to need, oh, it's so hard to say based on the number of plants. It really depends on your number of plants. Um, but if you're all your plants are touching each other and let's say you've got like 10 in a group together, that one sachet per 10, depending on the size, it's really hard for me to say. Um, but just start like that and make sure that if you don't do sachets in every pot, which I recommend you don't do sachets in every pot, just make sure the plants are touching so that they can move around onto the others. Um, and Californicus will go after not only Persimilis, but they'll go after other uh, spider mites as well. If you are not having success with the sachets, Maybe there's something going on there where the sachets got hot or too cold even. You know, you don't know what happens between when the sachets are made in the insectary and when they get to your house. Often they have to ship from overseas and then they go through another carrier and then another and then they come to you. So by the time they get to you, as a homeowner, they could be they could be a little old. And if if you're not seeing good success with that, it may be time to try out loose fill. Um, and loose fill is a lot easier to use and to see and to quality check right off the bat. When you get your 
Looseville product, stare at it. Um, and if you have a loop, get that out. If you're going to invest in predatory mites, I would invest in a loop. It's like $10. Um, and get your loop out. Get your eyeball really close to the loop, like super close to the loop, and get that whole, your whole eyeball loop combo really close to that brand. I see a lot of people when they try to use a loop, they have it like a foot away from their eye, and the loop is really close to the tissue, but it's like they're afraid to get close to it. Don't get, don't be afraid, get really close to that loop. And look at your mites. Look, take a little bit, put it on a white piece of paper, and just look. If you see movement, that's a good sign. Um, odds are you're going to be seeing the 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 feeder mites and the Californicus. So we can go over how to identify which one's which. But if you see movement, that's good. Um, you want to see movement. And then what you would do is you just kind of sprinkle it onto your plants, um, trying to get it on the leaves. Try to not sprinkle it into the soil if you can. Um, and this is where it gets a little tricky because it tends to like get everywhere, right? Um, Another thing that you could do, both with Californicus, if you're not sure if it's two-spotted, go to Californicus. If you are 100% sure it's two-spotted spider mite, Persimilis could be an option, depending on the conditions you have indoors. Um, and with Persimilis, they don't come with a feeder mite. It's going to be just Persimilis. So get those out ASAP because they will eat each other. Um, with Californicus, you've got a little bit more wiggle time because they've got some feeder mites in there. But another way you can put out both these mites if you get one of them is um, most predatory mites, most mites will go up, right? And so when you're storing your product, you don't want to store a bottle upright because what happens is all of the mites go to the tippy top of that bottle. But this works in your favor when you're putting them out. If you don't want to make a huge mess, um, you can just hold your bottle with your mites and tip it upwards and have the top point tip, the top of that bottle hit or touch your plant and just sit there and wait. And if you have really good eyesight, you'll see the mites walking out of the bottle once you open it and walking onto your plants. And that's an easy way to get them where you want them without any of the stuff, any of the carrier going everywhere. This does take a very long time though. So just be warned if you want to do it that way. Um, there was one last thing I want to say about predatory mites indoors. <sighs> They're going to die, <laughs> and it's just inevitable. Um, they're, if you have a lot of two-spotted, a lot of mites, they may survive for a little while. Um, also, keep in mind, what have you applied on those plants right before you get your predatory mites? Because I want you to be successful. If you are treating with um, the medical bread or something else, um, you may want to hold off on mites for a little while. Um, if you're treating, if you've just been treating with oil, oil typically doesn't have residual activity. It's contact, it hits it, it kills it, it's done. So if you've just been using oil, you should be okay going right in with mites. But if you've been using other kind of synthetic chemicals, maybe do a little bit more research on those um, to see if you can go in with mites or if you should wait a little while um, because they are sensitive to chemicals. Um, and regardless of the chemical residue or not, they're going to die. Um, and you may need to reapply them. Frequency depends on how much pests you have, et cetera, how many plants you have, et cetera, et cetera. But it won't just how be do you one know? and done. How do I know what? How do you know what? How do you know if you need to reapply and get more beneficial mites? Well, if you see more pest mites, however, I wouldn't just continue buying predatory mites if you never see a change in your pest mite population at all right? So ideally you would put out predatory mites. Keep in mind, they're going to work slower than chemicals. So when you put them out, you got to give them a little bit more time because it's not like a contact where all of them are going to die. They have to go and find them and eat them and then be hungry again to eat more, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to take a little while. Um, if you put them out and you don't see any changes, ugh, it's so hard to commit to a number on this one. Just it's very, general, general ballpark, you know, like general ballpark. Four to six weeks. Yes. Yes. About a month, right? We'll just say a month. If you put them out and you don't see any changes in a month, um, then you may want to just go back to oil or whatever you were using um, and kind of reevaluate. 
you will probably need to reply. I, I try to apply mites um, every other month, um, especially in the summer. Oh, gosh, in the summer, it's like all the time. It's just like a constant parade of two spotted spider mites. It's like, oh, my God. Um, so in the summer, maybe like once a month, um, which would give you the idea about a month if you if they worked at all or not. Um, so maybe about once a month. Um, or four times a year. Um, it depends on what you get, right? If you get the sachet, if you get the loose fill, <sighs> try it out, step back, evaluate how it, how it went and go from there. Excellent. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Good luck. I really hope it works for you. It's really tricky. It's not as straightforward as just like apply it and they, 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 they die. Um, it's biology. So there's a lot of other things that go on there. Even certain plants. Well, we won't get into it. Good luck. I hope it works for you. May the odds be in your favor. <laughs> and I hope that you start to like predatory mites. And I really hope that they work for you. Um, I really, really do. That's all. Thank you. All right. Question three. Uh, this comes from rocks in Moore, Oklahoma. Um, do I have to do something special to keep my houseplants safe during a heat wave? You know, I've never thought this, about it. Yeah, you know, this summer, this summer temperatures have have gotten pretty hot. You know, I know they've broken records in a lot of areas. Um, and if you don't have air conditioning or you keep your houseplants outside, um, you know, I can see how that might be a concern. My instinct is that you shouldn't need to do anything in particular. You know, most houseplants are from the, the tropics, you know, with the exception of those from like the cloud forests. And, mm -hmm. and so they should be able to withstand bouts of, of high temperatures without doing anything special. Now, um, if it is really super hot, you know, I would keep an eye on them, especially in terms of watering to make sure that they don't dry out a lot faster than they would um during the the less hot times um but then i would also you know watch watering in general to make sure that they're not slowing down and taking a break and you're not overcompensating and overwatering them if they're not really using it either yep um you know of course if you're if your plants are in the house you know the direct sun and temperature shouldn't really be an issue um if they're outside in the shade all shouldn't really be an issue if you do have any house plants that you do put out in the sun for the summer during an especially big heat wave because they're in typically in smaller containers moving to a shaded spot you know can help keep cooler a little bit you know i have to interject here and say i am one of those very very unfortunate souls that does not have air conditioning and it's been really hot this summer and I have fans in every single room. Um, so fans, if you are nervous or if your plants are struggling, because sometimes if it does get too hot, they can just stop. Like they're not going to die, but they'll stop um, respiring, transpiring, transpiration. What's the help me? Yep. All of the above. Oh, cool. OK, um, so they'll just stop and they won't do anything. And so getting a fan going over that would kind of help encourage them to continue to do something. Um, but like Justin said, most of the houseplants are grown in like really warm climates. Um, and I lived in Florida. I can attest it's very, very, very warm down there. Um, and so, you know, for us, these heat waves are just brutal. Um, but the plants, I think, are a lot better at you know, enduring the heat than we are. <laughs> so, so I have a, a greenhouse here in, in Oregon and last summer we had a, a heat dome. Um, air temperature was like 117. So in the greenhouse, I think one day it was 125. Oh I'm going to have a God. number of aeroids in the greenhouse. I have like several varieties of potho, several ficus, uh, raphidophora, um, a number of oxalis because I think oxalis are kind of cute. Um, and I didn't notice any seriously ill effect um, on on any of my plants during that that heat wave. Um, and so, yeah, in in my greenhouse, I would say 125. You know, didn't seem to phase them. It was it was only a couple of days. Um, so, yeah, I'd be inclined to say not. Don't be too worried. Yeah, that's uh, that's really hot. So, wow. 
Um, yeah, it was really hard to water. <laughs> I probably, I'm horrible. I probably would have just abandoned them or been like, all right. I probably would have just watered myself with the plants. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. Ew. That's horrible. Um, so on to our myth of the, of the episode. Yeah, let's do it. All right. This is kind of a fascinating one, uh, because there is a, there is a bit of truth baked in. Um, okay. Sort of. Oh, All right. Boy. So my peace lily won't bloom because it's either male or female and I need the opposite gender to make it bloom. So, so, you know, the nugget there is that there are some plants that are dioecious, you know, meaning you have the, the individual plant is of a single gender. Um, and I think the, the place where this myth has sort of come from that nugget is that in order to produce seeds, you need both genders. You need the, the male reproductive organs on the male plant. You need the female reproductive organs of the female plant. Um, but, you know, in the in the way that rumors, you know, take on a life of their own, that doesn't have anything to do with flowering. Right. And then the second part of why this one is a myth with Peace Lily, Michelle. Oh, uh, oh I thought you it... were going to take it away. No, I don't know. I, I don't know. Oh. oh, I feel horrible. I don't I don't. I'm going to guess. Can I guess something? And can you tell yeah, of me course. if I'm right or wrong? OK. Are you talking about like. The flowers versus the inflorescence, nope. or are you talking about them being a perfect flower? Yep. Okay. Whoo. Okay. All right. So peace lilies are a perfect flower. They have both male yep. and female parts. Yes. Yep. Okay. Woo. Yep. So <laughs> yeah. So, so so peace lilies, bathophyllum plants don't come as male or female. Every plant is both. Yes. So it's like, it's like anthuriums. It's like that little cone thing mm -hmm, in the exactly. middle has the male and the female spadex. parts. Thank you. Thank you. Spadex. Spadex. Not to be confused with spandex. Spadex. The part in the middle. And it has both male and female. Although they do, I don't know. Do you know? I'm going to test. I'm going to test the limits of the spathophyllum flower, whatever right. spadex knowledge here. Okay. Okay. Do they both mature at the same time? Um, I would guess it depends on the species. Okay, that's fair. That's valid. I would I would agree with that. I don't know anything about it, but that sounds right. <laughs> you know that okay. that is a that is a method that a lot of plants will use to present to prevent self fertilization, aka yes. incest of the plant world. Yeah, it's very you know, annoying. Yeah. You know, just like like some other plants um you know are self infertile where where you their pollen cannot fertilize um that that same plant variety. You know, we we see it um uh, really commonly like in fruit crops like apples. Yeah. A number of apple varieties yep. are self incompatible where mm -hmm. you have to get a different variety in order to to produce fruits. Uh, but true. again, has nothing to do with flowering. It only. It, it will flower and the flower will be both male and female. Exactly. Uh, okay. If your peace lily isn't blooming, the most probable reason is too little light or the plant is stressed from inconsistent watering or some other environmental condition that's just making it unhappy. Yep. Yep. I've seen this bath in Florida and even though they're under shade, there's still quite a lot of light, even with the diffusion of the sunlight. And there's a lot of blooms on those. And then I take it indoors and kaputs, no more blooms. Every now and then I'll get a bloom, but yeah, you're they, right. Light has a lot to do with that. Yeah. They tolerate low light as a great foliage plant. Uh huh. But if you want the flowers, they really need medium to bright light. Yes. Yep. I've seen it, unfortunately. Okay. Is that all for today? That's our lineup for today. Oh, all right. Well, glad we got to talk about bites. Thank you guys for asking.
Um, if you guys have any burning houseplant questions, reach out. Um, email us at questions at costafarms.com um, or put a note on any of our socials. Um, you can find us on most social media platforms at Costa Farms. Um, and your question might be featured on a future episode of Plant Prescription. Have a great happy weekend or whatever it is to you guys. Happy gardening, y'all. Bye-bye.